Thank you very much for coming to PDC this year, and thank you for attending this session. My name is Mohit Srivastav, and I'm here with my colleague, Tushar Shunbhag. We are both program managers in the Windows Azure product team. We have split this talk into two parts, so Tushar will kindly leave the stage for this half, and he'll rejoin us in the second half. In this session, we're going to discuss how it's easy to get started using PHP, Eclipse, Memcached, MySQL, and really a variety of technologies to build applications with Windows Azure. In addition, you'll see how it's easy to maintain and scale those applications by leveraging new Windows Azure platform primitives. We'll demonstrate all of this with a combination of customer showcases and technology drill downs, so that by the end of this talk, you'll be able to run these Windows Azure technologies yourself. If you're familiar with Windows Azure, you know that Windows Azure offers a number of capabilities. On-demand computational resources, storage at massive scale, and automated service management. Our goal in offering you these capabilities is to give you more time to write real code by reducing the time you have to spend on IT stuff, stuff like plumbing code, stuff like hardware management, et cetera, et cetera. But you might be wondering if you can take advantage of these capabilities using skills of your choice, your favorite languages, your favorite tools, and your favorite application components. We'll address that concern head on in this session by walking through some popular open source technologies running on Windows Azure. These are technologies used by popular sites like Facebook and Wikipedia, as well as popular applications like WordPress and MediaWiki. Most of you probably know what these are already, but we'll give them a brief introduction just in case. PHP is a web development language. Eclipse, an integrated development environment that's pretty popular with PHP developers. MySQL, a relational database. And finally, Memcached, a distributed memory cache. And as we walk through these technologies in this talk, we'll continually reinforce two key points. The first is that it is easy to get started. And you'll see this especially with the work we've done with PHP and Eclipse. In addition, you'll see that it's easy to maintain, scale, and more broadly enhance these applications for the cloud by leveraging new Windows Azure platform primitives. Uh, some examples of those include cloud storage, as well as endpoint and topology discovery. So let's get started looking at the development experience with PHP and Eclipse. Uh, the first thing we'll talk about is just the mechanics of running PHP code in Windows Azure. Uh, then you'll see how the Eclipse tooling streamlines the end-to-end -end experience of building, testing, and deploying PHP projects for Windows Azure. And we'll do this with both a new PHP project as well as an existing PHP project. Then we'll walk through some examples of enhancing PHP applications for the cloud. We'll scale a PHP app, and then we'll take an app that would have otherwise been written to use local storage and an on-premises SQL server and have it use Windows Azure blob storage and SQL Azure instead. So how do you run PHP in Windows Azure? It turns out it's very similar to how you would run .NET code in Windows Azure. In both cases, the code runs inside a Windows Azure web role. However, with PHP, you must also supply the PHP runtime, which you can download from php.net. And I apologize for um, leaving off a URL here. And then you, can point, then you need to point to that runtime via the fast CGI configuration in two places, the web.config and the web.roleconfig. This is very, very similar to what you would do in IIS. The main difference with IIS is web.roleconfig is applicationhost.config. And while this is straightforward and you know, very much the same as what you would do in IIS, our Eclipse tooling takes care of all of this for you 
and is available at Windows Azure 4e.org. And obviously the 4e stands for uh, 4 Eclipse. Okay, so let's just get started. What you're going to see here is I'm going to start with an existing PHP application that I downloaded from the web just yesterday. The application is called MediaWiki. It powers Wikipedia. I'm going to convert it to a Windows Azure project. I'm going to then test it in our Windows Azure simulation environment, which is called the development fabric. I'm going to finally prepare it for deployment to the actual cloud. So the first step is to go to Windows Azure for e.org and download the necessary bits. All the instructions are available simply by clicking on download. But to summarize, there's really just two key steps. The first is to download a version of Eclipse. My favorite is a version of Eclipse called PDT 2.1, which is a version of Eclipse with a bunch of PHP goodies built in. So you don't have to install all that stuff yourself. Once you do that, Eclipse has an inbuilt installation mechanism. And all you have to do there is point uh, that mechanism to a Windows Azure URL, which is uh, www.windowsazure4e.org slash update. And once you do that, uh, Eclipse takes care of downloading all the bits, keeping them up to date, et cetera. So let's switch to Eclipse. Okay. We can confirm that the Windows Azure bits have been installed by going to About Eclipse, selecting Installation Details, and confirming that there are six Windows Azure plugins here. The main one that's relevant for this talk is Windows Azure PDT, which stands for Windows Azure PHP Development Tools. So the first thing I'm going to do is import MediaWiki into Eclipse. I'm going to do that by creating a PHP project. Note that I'm selecting PHP project and not Windows Azure web project. So I'm going to say I want to create a project from an existing source, browse to where I downloaded MediaWiki, which I downloaded three times to allow for any uh, mistakes with the demo. <laughs> And I'm going to just go ahead and call this MediaWiki. And hit Finish. Okay, so, so far, we've done nothing specific to Windows Azure. All we've done is import MediaWiki into Eclipse. Now I'm going to right-click MediaWiki, select the Windows Azure context menu, and say Convert to Windows Azure PHP Project. While in this demo, I'm not going to actually use Windows Azure Storage or SQL Azure, I'm going to go ahead and select it anyway and hit OK. And what has happened just now is two distinct things. The first is my existing MediaWiki project now includes a Microsoft namespace and a set of Microsoft libraries. That's very handy if I wanted to take MediaWiki and have it use either Windows Azure Blob Storage or SQL Azure. In addition, a new project has been created. And this, this, this project describes my entire service. You know, right now, my service only contains one project, MediaWiki, but this could evolve to contain other parts as well. So let's actually go ahead and open up the service configuration. And we can see here that uh, the Eclipse tooling by default has chosen to run MediaWiki with just a single instance. Let's go ahead and change this to two. And now that I'm content with what I've done with my uh, application, we'll, we're going to now test it in the local simulation environment, which again is called the Windows Azure Development Fabric. So to do that, I, you're going to see me right-click MediaWiki a number of times in this demo. I'm going to right-click MediaWiki. Again, choose the Windows Azure context menu and say Run in Development Fabric. So what's happening right now is three distinct things. The first thing is my service is being packaged up in very much the same way it would be packaged up if I was, as if I was deploying it to the actual cloud. The next thing that happens is that my service gets deployed to the local simulation environment called the development fabric. And then the final thing that's going to happen is my browser will start up so I can validate that everything is working okay. 
So we can take a look at the simulation environment and see that both my instances are starting up right now. My first web role instance just started. My second one started. And my browser is confirming that PHP is running. So I know of an existing page in MediaWiki. It's called redirect.php. And we can see here that we have MediaWiki running in our local development fabric, and again, running with two instances. And obviously, we didn't set up the database, so it's telling me that, hey, you're missing your database. And Tishar's going to show you how to set up a database in the second half. But the point is we were able to take an existing PHP application, convert it to a Windows Azure project, test it in multiple instance format uh, within just a matter of minutes. So now that you've seen how to run PHP code in Windows Azure, what if you want to use cloud storage from PHP? And by cloud storage, we really mean two things. We mean Windows Azure storage, which includes blob storage, table storage, and queues, as well as SQL Azure. And since this is cloud storage, you can access it from PHP code that both runs inside Windows Azure as well as PHP code that's running outside Windows Azure. So for example, PHP code running in an on-premises environment or PHP code running in a completely different uh, data center. To get started with using PHP with Windows Azure storage, you can download the SDK from CodePlex or alternatively, it just gets included automatically as part of the Eclipse tooling we've seen earlier. And what this SDK provides is a PHP, 100% native PHP programming model for Windows Azure. And the really nice thing about that is it means you get things like inline completion, or auto-completion rather, and inline documentation. And you'll see an example of that in a few minutes. Uh, in addition to wrapping up blobs, tables, and queues, it also um, supports storing PHP sessions and table storage. To access SQL Azure from PHP, you also go to CodePlex. Uh, this time it's SQL Server PHP.CodePlex.com. And as with the uh, Windows Azure Blob Storage SDK, this also just gets installed automatically as part of the Eclipse tooling we've seen earlier. So my personal preference is to just go ahead and install the Eclipse tooling. Uh, and this supports PHP access to SQL Azure. The interesting thing about this driver is, is that it's the SQL Server driver, not the SQL Azure driver. And the point is that you can switch between SQL Server and SQL Azure simply by, con by changing the connection string. So if I had a PHP application that was written to use an on-premises SQL Server, I could change the connection string, point it to SQL Azure, and I'm good to go. So on to our next demo. So what we're going to do here is we'll take a pretty common application pattern used by content management systems and used by blogs. So what they do oftentimes is they'll take their image data and store the image data in the file system, and then they'll store the keyword or the metadata in a database. So we're going to do the exact same thing here, except that our image data is going to go in Windows Azure blob storage instead of the local file system. And the metadata is going to go in SQL Azure instead of uh, a traditional on-premises database. Okay, so this time around, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and simply create a Windows Azure web project. I'll, give, I'll call this PHP PDC. And I'm going to indicate that I want to use both Windows Azure data storage and SQL Azure, so the appropriate libraries, et cetera, get included for me. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to import the images that I, that I plan on uploading to Windows Azure. And again, this is only the clip step. It's not a Windows Azure step. File system. And okay, and uh, here I'm going to select that I have want to import two images, a SQL Azure.png. and the Windows Azure.png, our two favorite logos. <laughs> okay, 
So now this application we're going to write has two pages. The first page is a page that lets me add images and the tags associated with an images. And the other page is a page that lets me search those images by tag. So let me go ahead and create two empty PHP files. So let's call this creatively like addimages.php. And we'll call our other one something creative like searchimages.php. Okay. So I'm going to pull in some template code for add images. And just rest assured that the only things I've done in this template code are set some local variables and put in some helper functions. We're going to write the code to actually put the images into Windows Azure Blob Storage right here. So the first thing I need to do is create a client that points to Windows Azure Blob Storage. So we're going to go ahead and call that Blob Client. Now I know, I remember vaguely that the name of the class starts with Microsoft, Windows Azure something, but I don't remember the exact name. So I can hit control space and get a list of possible completions and can see that one of the choices is Windows Azure Storage Blob. I'm pretty sure that that's the class I need to use to connect to Windows Azure Blob Storage. Now once I've done that, I can hover over the class and see all the possible parameters. In this case, I only care about the first three. I'm going to pick the host name, which is the URL for blob storage, my account information, and my account key. For the blob storage URL, that's also defined as a constant, so I can again use our completion feature. I'm hit control space and see that there's a URL underscore cloud blob, which is the URL for Windows Azure uh, blob storage. Then I give it my account name and my account key. Okay, now that I've done this, let's go ahead and actually upload the images to Windows Azure blob storage. So again, I can use my blob client put a little nice arrow there, hit control space, and discover that there's a put blob method on my blob client. Okay, I see here that this takes a number of parameters, the container name, the blob name, and the local file name. So my container name is going to be called images. The local file name is called Windows windowsazure.png. Or sorry, the blob name is Windows Azure PNG, and the local file name has the same name. Okay, and let's go ahead and do that once more, this time for um, the SQL Azure image. Okay, now that we've put both these blobs in blob storage, let's actually print out the URL so that we can confirm that they were uploaded properly. And this is one of those helper methods I was telling you about Set this return value. And so that's it. That's really all it took to establish a connection to Windows Azure Blob Storage, upload two images, and uh, print out the URLs for those results. Now that we've added the images to Windows Azure Blob Storage, let's add the search keywords to SQL Azure. And because the SQL Azure code is very similar to what you would do with SQL Server, we're not going to go into all the details but I'll highlight some of the key points. The first thing I need to do is establish a connection to SQL Server. And you'll see here that this is very, very similar to what you would do, uh, or with SQL Azure. Uh, and you'll see that this is very, very similar to what you would do to establish a connection with SQL Server. The only real difference here is that my server name is pointing to an endpoint on the internet, a SQL Azure endpoint as opposed to like an on-premises SQL Server endpoint. Once I establish the connection, I'm going to actually write the code now to add the tags. 
And you can see here that this is your standard SQL Server syntax. And in addition, this is reinforced that SQL Azure supports parameterized queries, so I avoid SQL injection issues. So I've already gone ahead and wrote the code to put two tags here. I'm putting in the tag database for SQL Azure and the tag compute for Windows Azure. Let's put in the tag Azure for both of them. So what we're doing here again is we're inserting some tags into a metadata table. Now that I've added the tags, let's write the code for the search side. So again, the first thing I need to do here is establish my connection to SQL Azure. You can use the exact same snippet I used earlier. But this time, instead of writing the insert code, we're going to write search code. Again, you can see here we have, a, we have a parameterized query. So essentially, it's selecting from the URL table where tag equals a parameter. And that parameter is coming. That parameter is coming from, from a form value that we've, or from a, a query parameter we've called tag. So that's it. Let's see if we can test this in the Windows Azure uh, simulation environment. So again, I'm going to right click, choose Windows Azure, and say run in development fabric. And the same steps are happening that you saw earlier. My service is getting packaged up. It's being deployed to the local simulation environment. And finally, my browser will start up so I can test all of this. There's my instance. It's calling run. It started, yes. Doesn't mean it will work, but it's halfway there. Okay. So if you remember, we had two, two pages here. We had add images. And we had, we had add images and we had search images. Okay, so far so good. Okay, so add images here is simply confirming that both of our images, Windows Azure PNG, and SQL Azure PNG were uploaded to Windows Azure Blob Storage. You can click on this, see the Windows Azure logo. You can click on this and see the SQL Azure logo. Now let's test out our searching against SQL Azure. So if I type in compute, I only get back the image for Windows Azure. If I type in the search database, no surprise, I get back the image for SQL Azure. And if I type in Azure, we'll see both, which is the point, because <laughs> they work together really well. <laughs> okay. Okay, so now that we've seen the development experience of using PHP and Windows Azure, we're, no, we're now going to dive into running some open source application components on Windows Azure. And we're going to start off with memcached, which is a distributed, a very popular distributed memory cache used by all kinds of sites, sites like Facebook, et cetera. And we're going to demonstrate this with a combination of a customer showcase and a technology drill down. So uh, one of our customers, AdSlot, is building a highly scalable auction service and the key thing, the key differentiator here is that, is that it helps advertisers save money by bidding on combinations of keywords at a time instead of on single keywords. And as you might expect, not only is this very computation heavy, they also have a need for real-time computation results. Uh, in addition, they have a need for interop between .NET and non-.NET technologies. Uh, in this case, between ASP.NET and Memcached. And these requirements made the cloud, and specifically Windows Azure, a really good fit. So how are they using Memcached? They're using Memcached in actually a lot of different ways. I picked the two that I thought were the most interesting, so you didn't have to squint to see a whole bunch of boxes. Uh, the first way they're doing it is they're using Memcached 
to store their ASP.NET MVC models. And the nice thing here is by moving their model cache from the local instance to a dedicated caching tier, they can now load balance traffic on their web tier without any need for affinity. So they can optimize the utilization of their web tier uh, most efficiently by externalizing the cache to a dedicated tier. In addition, they're using memcached to store intermediate computation results. And if you're familiar with the computer science term called memoizing, this is very similar to that. So what they do here is subsequent computations take advantage of the results from earlier computations, and, it, and by caching those results, they save recomputation re over and over again. Uh, in both cases, they really have a need to scale that memcached D, D tier up and down based on their load. Because they run auctions certain times of the year, their load increases, they need a very heavy, mem a very fat memcached D tier. And other times of the year, they have less traffic and need a smaller tier. Uh, one other point here. I will use my keyboard. Yeah, and, and the, the interesting thing here is if you're going to scale your memcached D tier, the clients need to discover that new memcached D nodes have come up or, or a memcached D nodes have gone down and adjust accordingly. So we're going to see how that works uh, with a code example. So the first thing you see here is the initialization code. So really there's only one line here that's specific to Windows Azure. Other than that, it's just standard you know, memcached D code you would run outside Windows Azure. And what it's doing here, it's, it's newing up a memcached D client. It's enumerating all the instances of memcached D running inside my service and then setting up the, connect, the client's connection table. Again, there's only one line here, Windows Azure specific. Now what about the case I just talked about when a new memcached instance comes up or goes down? Well, that's what you see here. We've introduced a new event called role environment.changed, which tells you when there's a change to your, the topology of your deployment. And when I get this event, what I can do is I can check if it's a topology change and just reinitialize my client. Just a matter of two, you know, it's really only two lines of code to do what sounds like a pretty complicated, you know, complicated thing. And after that, I can use my memcached D client in exactly the same way as I would outside Windows Azure. You can simply make client.get or client.set calls. Uh, while what we've just described is straightforward, our partner Infosys has built a solution accelerator for memcached D that streamlines this even further. And what the accelerator contains is, is, is a, a solution with two projects, no surprise, the, you know, the server side and an example client side. And one interesting thing that they've added that I didn't talk about is they use a special client library uh, called Enium. And Enium is really designed uh, ideally for cloud scenarios. It uses something called consistent caching, which minimizes the invalidation of your cache when new nodes are added or removed. So it's really an ideal, um, hashing algorithm and, a, and, a, and an ideal uh, client library uh, to use with memcached D in a cloud environment. And Tishar, I think, will point us to the link, um, link for all the solution accelerators. Okay, so now that we've talked about the development experience in PHP and Eclipse, the memcached D app and the memcached D application component, I'm gonna hand it over to Tishar who's gonna take over the rest of the talk and talk about how to run MySQL in Windows Azure. Thanks, Mohit. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Good afternoon. So we just saw how to use PHP and, and Memcached to build applications for Windows Azure. We also saw how to use SQL Azure to build applications on Windows Azure. Some of you out there might already have technology investments in database technologies such as MySQL, and you would want to continue leveraging that investment as you build and run your services on Windows Azure. So what I'm gonna talk about next is how to use MySQL in your Windows Azure applications. And then we'll look at how all what you saw today come together in compelling real world scenarios. Let's first start off by looking at a simple configuration of MySQL on Windows Azure. 
as some of you might know, MySQL has a SKU that, uh, for Windows that's XCopy deployable. You would enable this configuration on Windows Azure by taking that SKU off MySQL and running it in one instance of a worker role and storing the database in the local disk and serving data to a web-based front end that's running in a web role. Now I'm going to show you how easy it is to get this configuration up and running in Windows Azure. But first, I want to walk you through the steps, and then we'll see this in action. So what are the steps? Firstly, in the worker role, you want to copy the MySQL binaries, the, the MySQL SKU for Windows that I mentioned, to the worker role subdirectory. Then in code, you want to copy the files that, since you're storing the database on the local disk, and uh, the role VHD is read-only, you want to copy the files to the read-write local storage. Then you want to configure MySQL to listen on the right port on the worker role. And once MySQL is up and running, you want to monitor the health of that MySQL instance. And if it were to go down, you want to recycle the role. On the web role, you would discover the IP address and the port number at which MySQL is running on the worker role. You would have to do this because the IP address and the port number are not known ahead of time. And then from that point on, you access MySQL as you normally would. Of course, in the web role, you may have to handle some topology changes. Uh, for example, if the worker role were to go down and come back up at a different IP address and port number, you would have to rediscover that and rebind to that IP address and port. All right, so let's see this in action. I'm going to switch to my laptop. Oh, it's logged off again. Logged back into my screen. So I have a simple solution with this configuration open in my Visual Studio window. So I'm going to switch to that. So this is my simple project where I have one worker role that runs MySQL. And then I have a web role that runs some PHP code, which accesses MySQL that's running in the worker role. So what I have open on, the, on this window over here is the configuration file for my, uh, for my Windows Azure project. And as you can see, we have one instance of the, the MySQL worker role and one instance of the PHP web role. So this is exactly the configuration that we saw a couple slides back. So let's dig a little bit into the MySQL worker role. So we see that we have a worker role.cs uh, file in there that handles some of the code that we, that we talked about on the previous slide. So let me unpin the solution explorer from the screen so we have a little more uh, real estate. So let's walk through this part of the code, which is in the on start method. So first, we get um, the base directory in the, on the local storage. And we copy over the files into that. Then we get the endpoint details, um, the information about the IP address and the port number at which MySQL should be running. And we update the my.ini file for MySQL to start at that IP address and port. And then through the command process, we launch MySQL. Before we exit the function, we loop and wait till MySQL starts. And then we exit the on start method. And we enter the run method. All we do in the run method is monitor MySQL. In monitoring MySQL, all we're doing is trying to connect to MySQL. We retry for a few times. If, if we don't hear back, then we recycle the role. So let's go and look at our simple PHP code that we are going to use to access MySQL. So that's over here in my sample.php file. So the first three lines over here in my sample.php are retrieving the IP address and the port number where my MySQL instance is running in the worker role. And it's getting this from an environment variable uh, just in order to keep this PHP file really simple. I'll show you where these environment variables are being set. These are set in the global.asx file, where basically we're using the platform primitives to discover the IP address and the port number. And we set them in the environment variable over here. 
And these are retrieved by our sample.php file. So sample.php, once it retrieves the IP address and the port number, goes ahead to connect to MySQL at that IP address and port, creates a database, creates a table, and then insert, inserts three values. Once it's done inserting, it retrieves those three values and prints them out in a table. Now, if you notice, we're not checking for any errors because we want to keep this as simple as possible. Now, there's one step missing, if you notice, and that is copying the MySQL binaries to the worker role subdirectory. So I'm going to switch to my console window and do the copying. So I'm going to xcopy files from the directory where I have downloaded all of the MySQL binaries to the worker role subdirectory in the MySQL subfolder and hit enter. Now this might take a little bit, so we're not going to wait for this to finish. I already have this solution deployed to the local cloud simulation environment, the development fabric that Mohit just showed you. So I'm going to switch to that window. So here we see our single instance MySQL solution that we just saw in Visual Studio deployed to the local cloud simulation environment. So we see we have one instance of the worker role running MySQL, which is uh, dumping out some spew. And then we have one instance of the PHP web role, which uh, it reports to me that it has been started. So let's go ahead and open a browser window and point it to the local machine at 127.0.1 at port 81, where my PHP web role is running. So I accessed this page earlier today. As we can see, uh, we get the confirmation that PHP is running. So let me open sample.php. And as we see, we have the three rows that we inserted and are, are being read back for us. So if I hit F5, we see that the same three rows keep getting inserted and read back. So there we have a simple PHP program accessing MySQL in a simple configuration in a worker role in Windows Azure. Switching back to the slide deck. So we saw how easy it was to deploy MySQL in Windows Azure in the simple configuration. And this is a popularly used configuration for web applications. However, some scenarios may warrant greater durability and reliability. You would normally achieve this by running MySQL in a master-slave replication uh, configuration. You can do this in Windows Azure by adding a second instance of the same worker role and setting up master-slave configuration. And this takes care of the durability and availability issues that you may have with a single instance configuration. For example, in the single instance configuration, since you're storing data on the local disk, if the instance were to go down, not only would you have availability loss, you, would, you may also have data loss. And this uh, obviates, uh, it sort of alleviates that issue. In addition, you can add more instances to replicate from the same master, thereby enabling the web role to fan out read queries to multiple replicas, maximizing your read throughput. An alternative approach to achieve the availability and durability for MySQL in Windows Azure would be to use a Windows Azure Drive, which was introduced by Ray today in the keynote. A Windows Azure Drive is a durable, mountable NTFS volume which is backed by Windows Azure Storage. All writes to the Windows Azure Drive are instantly durable. And a Windows Azure Drive can be mounted in read-write mode on only one VM at a time. So for MySQL, to solve the durability issue, it would mount a Windows Azure Drive onto its local VM in read-write mode and store the database on the Windows Azure Drive so that all the writes are instantly durable. In order to address the availability issue, we would have a second instance of the same worker role running MySQL, but in this case, it would just be spinning like a hot spire, trying to get a read-write lock on the Windows Azure Drive. In the event of failure, the hot spare would grab the read-write lock on the Windows Azure Drive and start serving requests to the web role. And that's how you would achieve durability and reliability. In this configuration, you could also add multiple replicas, as before, to maximize your read throughput. Essentially, you can run MySQL in a slew of different configurations on Windows Azure. 
And what I'm going to introduce to you now is the concept of MySQL Solution Accelerator, which just like the Memcached Solution Accelerator have been built by our partners, Infosys. The MySQL Solution Accelerators manage the lifecycle of MySQL in Windows Azure in a worker role in master-slave configurations. They leverage Windows Azure primitives to help MySQL um, launch the Windows Azure drive, to perform master election and replication on, on startup, as well as on failover. They enable the scaling up and scaling down of slave instances in order to maximize read throughput. And finally, they perform periodic backups, both full and incremental, if you choose to store your data on the local disk. The solution accelerator is available with source code, and we'll see how to use that in just a little bit. But the point is, you can take the solution accelerator and tweak it to suit your particular scenarios. So let's see the solution accelerators in action. I'm going to switch to my demo machine. So I have the solution accelerator open in my Visual Studio window. But before we go there, I'm going to quickly show you where you can download them. So we have uh, the Windows Azure interoperability portal. So that's where these uh, solution accelerators will be up. I checked a little while back, and I didn't see the links up yet. But they should be live uh, pretty soon. So do check after the talk, and you'll see links for multiple solution accelerators at the Windows Azure interoperability portal at windowsazure.com slash interoperability. So the solution accelerators are downloadable as MSIs. And when you uh, launch the MSI, they extract a solution, a prepackaged, self-contained solution. I've already extracted the solution into my local disk. And they're sitting in this directory over here. I'm just going to do a dir to show you the contents. So as we see, we have a self-contained solution, the MySQL PHP.SLN. And that's the solution that I have open in my Visual Studio window. So let me switch to that. So here we see, as before, we have a MySQL worker role and a PHP-based web role. In this case, the PHP-based web role is running PHP MyAdmin, which is a popular web-based uh, administration tool you often use with MySQL. And we'll see this in action in just a little bit. The other two projects that you see are an instance manager client and instance manager server. We won't talk about it now, but I'll come back to this in a couple of, uh, in a couple of slides. So what I have up here is the configuration file for this project. And we see that we have three instances of the MySQL worker role and one instance of the PHP MyAdmin web role. And we'll see this in action in just a little bit. But I want to dig in a little bit more into the MySQL worker role. We see here that there are a few more files in addition to the worker role.cs file that we saw for the simple configuration. We have files with handle master election, logging, failover, and so on and so forth. And these are all pre-built for you so that you can take these and tweak it to suit your particular scenarios. The other aspect of the solution accelerator that I want to point out is you can pick and choose the projects from this self-contained solution into your Windows Azure solution. For example, if you just want to use MySQL, you would take the MySQL worker role, drop it into your Windows Azure solution that needs MySQL, and go from there. If you would also like to add PHP MyAdmin to administer MySQL, you can add this project into your solution, and so on. So I have this self-contained solution built and deployed to the Windows Azure cloud. And I'm going to show this to you running. So let me switch to my browser window that's pointing to Azure MySQL.CloudApp.net and pointing to the PHP MyAdmin index page. So I'm pretty sure this is logged out. So I'm going to take the IP address, just so we don't lose it. Let me click on Home again to see if it's still logged in. It's not. So let me paste the IP address back, type my username, nope. MySQL user, type my password, and hit Go. So this logs me into, uh, into PHP MyAdmin, which is connecting to the MySQL instance that's running in a worker role um, in the, my same service, the service that you saw open in Visual Studio. Now we connect it to one instance. In this case, this is the master instance. And we see now that PHP MyAdmin has logged into the master instance of MySQL running in master-slave configuration in the Windows Azure Cloud. So I'm going to perform some simple administration operation, like looking at what databases there are. And this will list out what databases are 
uh, are present in my MySQL worker role. And we see we have two databases. So this is standard PHP MyAdmin, so I won't go into a lot of detail. This is, uh, those of you who are familiar with this can just use PHP MyAdmin in a web role, accessing MySQL in a worker role. So I'm gonna switch back to my slide deck. So we saw how simple it is to use a solution accelerator with PHP MyAdmin to administer MySQL. While PHP MyAdmin is preferred by a lot of users, some users simply prefer to use a command line interface to interact with MySQL. For this purpose, our partners Infosys have also built an instance manager solution accelerator. That's, those are the two things that I alluded to you in the previous project. We'll go back and look at them again. So the instance manager solution accelerator provide command line access to worker role instances. In this case, it will be MySQL, which is running in the worker role. It has two components, a server component that runs in each worker role instance that you want to administer using the command line uh, interface, and a client component, which shows the web-based UI for remote command execution. So let's see this in action once again. So switching back to my Visual Studio window, I see that we have the client component and the server component. So if you wish to, wish to have your worker role instances administered by uh, Instance Manager, you would have to reference the Instance Manager server component. And the client component runs in a web role. So since I have this solution deployed uh, to the cloud and we saw it being accessed by PHP MyAdmin, we'll access the same MySQL instances and see the experience of administering it using the Instance Manager UI. So I'll switch to my browser window where I have Instance Manager UI open. So I'll just hit enter again so we get a fresh page to show you how, to show you the interaction from scratch. So we see that we have three worker load instances that the Instance Manager has located. Let's connect to the instance zero. We can connect to each instance and open a command window and execute commands in that instance. What we'll see is that a new tab opens up for each instance that you want to administer. So let's go back to instance zero. And I'm going to change directory to MySQL, to the MySQL directory. Let me click in here, MySQL bin, and hit enter. So we see that we are in the MySQL bin directory right now. And then I'm going to type a simple MySQL command, just like I did in PH, with the PHP MyAdmin window, and hit enter. And just to be safe, I'll repaste we see that the port number is same, I'll repaste the IP address and hit enter. So what this is doing is it's, in the web-based UI, it's accepting a command line command and executing it on the, on the worker role instance that you have connected to and getting the results back and displaying on the web-based UI. So we see over here that we've got the list of databases, exactly the same uh, thing we did with PHP MyAdmin. Of course, you can do more advanced features with the Instance Manager UI you can you know, set permissions and so on and so forth. You can use MySQL without PHP MyAdmin or the Instance Manager, but they are provided as solution accelerators for your convenience so that you can pick and choose the components that you wish to use in your Windows Azure solution as you use MySQL. Let's switch back to the slide deck. So to summarize, we've seen a few solution accelerators by now especially those from MCACHD and MySQL. They show you best practice deployments for these technologies on Windows Azure so that they can leverage Windows Azure primitives and mount Windows Azure drives, use Windows Azure storage, discover IP addresses, other servers, and lifecycle. They can benefit from the features of Windows Azure, such as dynamic scaling, failover, and in-place upgrades and in general help you with automating the life cycle of, your, of these technologies. And finally, we saw the Instance Manager Solution Accelerator for remote command execution. Now, as promised, we're gonna see all of what you've seen together, all of what you've seen today, rather, come together in a real-world scenario. And for that, I'm gonna use MediaWiki. As Mohit showed earlier, we had MediaWiki running as a pure PHP web role. Now what I'm going to show you is MediaWiki running in the Windows Azure cloud using our solution accelerators, namely the Memcached, MySQL, um, and the Instance Manager Solution Accelerators. MediaWiki, as Mohit mentioned, is 
uh, the PHP-based wiki that powers Wikipedia. It's usually used with MySQL and Memcached. And it's used by many companies for instance of our internal knowledge management and content management systems. So let's quickly look at the architecture for MediaWiki on Windows Azure. So we have the MySQL solution accelerator and the Memcached solution accelerators, both running in the worker role. And we've also added the instance manager and PHP MyAdmin in the web role from the project that she saw before. And we have MediaWiki running in a web role. So MediaWiki accepts web requests, first goes to memcached to see if the data is present in, in the cache, and then goes to MySQL to retrieve data. Of course, PHP MyAdmin is, as I showed you, is used for administering MySQL. And you have the Instance Manager Solution Accelerator to administer both MySQL and the memcached worker roles. So let's see, let's see MediaWiki running on Windows Azure. So I have MediaWiki here running at azuremediawiki.cloudapp.net. And a little while back, I created my very first page. So I'm going to go ahead and click Edit and see if I can change the contents of my page. And this, this goes into the Edit page where I can say, yay, I can edit. And I can go down here and save. So when this comes up, it will show you the new page. We're not going to wait for this to finish. We'll switch back to the slide deck because we want to leave some time for questions. The next thing what I want to show you is a customer showcase, that of Glimpse. Glimpse is a mobile consumer application that allows people to share and view their location in real time. So we have Glimpse running on Windows Azure in a very similar architecture as MediaWiki. It's got MySQL, though, running in a single instance configuration and Memcached running in the worker role. It's got a front end, which is ASP.NET based, which uses Bing Maps API to render uh, tracking information. What we've done for the demo is we've taken some tracking information or tracking data, which is transmitted by a GPS-enabled device, and preloaded that into the MySQL worker role. This tracking information is from a Microsoft Learning bus tour that went around Europe uh, in the last week of October and the first week of November. The tour is now over, but in the demo, you'll see that the front end's replaying the tour data, uh, which is leveraging both MySQL and Memcached. So let me switch to the demo machine. Oh, so here we see Wikipedia has come back with, uh, with the update. So I'm going to minimize this window. In fact, I'll minimize all of them. And I will go to my browser window where I have the Glimpse UI running, and I'll hit F5. Or refresh, rather. So when this page comes back, you would see Glimpse replaying uh, tour bus data from the last week of October to the first week of November. So this is the Glimpse UI starting up. That's their logo. And now, as you see, it's using Bing Maps API to follow the bus as it goes around Europe. And all this data is stored in, in MySQL. And this particular page, because I've, I've referenced it a few times, is being served from the memcached. Switching back to the slide deck. Before we end the talk, I just wanted to take a moment to sort of clarify the usage for MySQL Solution Accelerator and SQL Azure Storage. So we've heard about SQL Azure Storage, and we've also heard about MySQL Solution Accelerators. SQL Azure Storage is our strategic investment for the Windows Azure platform for a database as a service. The MySQL Solution Accelerators, on the other hand, are meant for compatibility with MySQL apps to help you get up and running in quick time and maintain and scale your current existing investment in MySQL that you want to continue to leverage on Windows Azure. Finally, the takeaways. We've shown you powerful platform primitives that we have unveiled in this release of Windows Azure. We've shown you support for PHP and Eclipse out of the box. We've also shown you the commitment of our partner community in solution accelerators for, My for MySQL and Memcached, which help you get up and running really quickly and help you manage, maintain, and scale your applications on Windows Azure. And we've seen all of this running in real-world applications. Thank you so much for, to coming, for coming to our talk. 
Really appreciate your time and attention. Thank you. So I'd like to invite Mohit back up on stage to take some questions. And before you, you guys leave, I just want to point out some, some talks that you may be interested in, uh, primarily the Windows Azure blobs and, and drives deep dive, which happens tomorrow at 4.30 PM. And some others, the Windows Azure monitoring and logging and management, which happens tomorrow at 11 AM. The Windows Azure tables and queues deep dive, which happens tomorrow at 3 PM. And automating the application lifecycle with Windows Azure, which is day after tomorrow at 10 AM. And finally, don't forget the swag. If you attend both the session and the lab, you get a camera. And if you attend just the session, you get the mouse. <laughs> Please don't forget to collect these. Thank you. <laughs>